Hello, SQL Bits. Have you been having fun today? There we go. Is that Andy? Hello. Sorry. I can just use this to say hello to people I know in the audience. <laughs> hello and welcome, everybody. So, hello. So we're uh, going to do uh, a session called Reporting on 1.4 Billion Rows with Serverless SQL Pools. But basically, we just use serverless SQL pools. And by basically, our life is pretty good right now, because we, we don't really have to do anything. Serverless, everything takes care of itself. So I would say, let's play a video game. Oh, let's do play again. Space Invader is always fun. Oh, no. Oh, who's that? Oh, all right. Oh, hold on. So wait a minute. I've just got a call I need to take. It's a boss. Yeah. Boss, hello? We can't hear you. He, but he yeah. looks angry. He looks angry. He does look angry. Oh, damn, damn, damn. I, I think, think we screwed up something. I think he's on the way. Yeah, yeah. All right, OK. okay. <laughs> well, it's, oh, no, he, okay. Looks, uh, okay. he looks even angrier now. He looks now. even angrier. OK. Just, just kill him. It'll, kill it'll him. come over. All right. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. OK. Yeah. What, what's uh, switch over to, to our slides. We're not gaming, okay? We're not gaming. We're not doing anything. Oh, what no. are you two muppets doing? <laughs> it, it was his fault. Yeah, he wanted to play Space Invaders. I was, I was working on your report. I want my report, and I want it now! But okay. I, bet. <laughs> I, I didn't know he was so good at acting. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really Thanks, my report! <laughs> yeah, sorry. Now. Oh, yeah. I am scared. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Okay, we'll get on to it. Okay, uh, right, right now. Right, right I mean, seriously, how hard is it to fix a power by report? It's it's clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy, five it's minutes to wow, whatever. It's it's supposed to be this. It's co it's more complicated than you yeah, think. Sure. You keep telling that. Yeah. We, we need to do steps before we can actually do something. So Okay, so two steps so, and we're done. No, no, we need to analyze the problem and then we can go and fix it, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. So okay. if you can calm down for a bit. Calm God, he should be a router, shouldn't he? He's yeah. really good at that. Whew. <laughs> I was actually scared. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we've got an issue. We've got a report, Benny's report, and it's running really, really, really slow. So basically, the report's really slow, but we haven't really tried anything, so, and it's still slow, because we thought that everything would be solved with just using serverless. Did you tell him to turn it on and off again? Ah, I forgot oh. to turn it. Ah, sorry. So yeah, Benny, have you tried turning it off and on again? No. OK. So. Just a quick introduction on us. My name is Stan Valens. Uh, I'm a senior fast track engineer at Microsoft, uh, and I work for customers that basically uh, want to move to Azure or are working on Azure and want to optimize stuff there. Uh, and I work primarily, primarily on Synapse. I'm a program manager on Azure Synapse Analytics, and I help customers who've got problems. And Benny is also a program manager, and he helps customers with problems with Power BI. But Power BI has no problems. Indeed. It's always fast. <laughs> anyway, quick show of hands. Who here has ever worked with serverless SQL pools? OK, a oh, few people. Good, great, good great. For the people that haven't worked with it, I'll do a very, very short introduction about what it is like and what you need to think about. So serverless SQL pools basically is our unicorn, as we say it. It's like our go-to new distributed system, which is based on the Polaris white paper. Now. Previously, in our MPP systems, we're limited to a few things that are in the background. While looking at the Polaris white paper, we basically are able to scale out, scale up our nodes, uh, and work in a different way. Now, serverless is an on-demand query engine. So basically, it means that you just send in the query, and you pay for each query that you execute. And you pay about how much per terabyte? It's about, about five pounds. About five pounds per terabyte. So basically, what you want to do when you're using your serverless SQL pools is basically reduce the amount of data that you're reading, if you reduce the amount of data that you're reading, you will reduce your cost, but you will also see that you improve your performance. And that's mainly the goal of today's session. We're going to walk you through all the optimization steps you can take using a very slow report and making it faster and faster and faster every step of the way and everything you change. So if it's serverless, does that mean I don't have any servers? You don't really have a server, indeed. So I don't have to pay anything? You have to pay for your query. Oh, okay, That's it. Right. It's basically an on-demand thing. Oh, OK, good. We have some nice visualizations. So Benny, you're paying for a server. <laughs> so 
let's go and look at the original. So uh, the original report, let me just switch over to it for a second. It's over here. So the original report, uh, let me duplicate my screen. That's going to be better. Duplicate. OK. So the original report, uh, that's the wrong report. The original report, uh, as you can see here, it's the slow report. If you look at the run times, we see that uh, this runs in about two minutes, uh, which is basically unacceptable if you're trying to run something you want this to run like this. People don't like to wait. Um, now, if we look at what it's built on, it's basically built on a file set you can see over here, which is just a bunch of CSV files without any structure in it. So it's just about, uh, I think, 150 gigs, 180 gigs of yeah. data, something like that. So um, if we look at um, what we do, it's basically if we're using CSV, any calculation or anything that we're doing, we'll scan that full list, all those CSVs, which means we read loads of data to get those calculations. It is quite fast, because it is on a vast amount of data, but we're quite fast even with CSV. Um, you can use this, for example, to import or direct query, uh, but it will be slower because the volume is quite large. You can optimize that by actually adding statistics or partitioning to those CSV files, uh, but those are only basically the two things you can do. Now, yeah, okay. So hands up, who's using CSVs? With a, there were loads of hands for serverless, but only a few. Okay, very interesting. Let's switch over. So. So one of, the, one of the most important or the most significant things about CSVs is there's no data typing. You know, it's just stuff. How does the engine know about stuff? You know, that thing in that file could be an int, could be a varchar, it could be a decimal, could be absolutely anything. So the people who have been, the PG, who have been working on power on on serverless have built us something called parser version 2.0 and that works tries to work out what the data types could be so if i just run that there's no data typing but parser 2.0 adds data typing so how do we know it's doing it because when i look at it in the query output could be anything so there's this magic query called SP Describe First Result Set, and it takes a chunk of the first results that come out, and it will tell us what data types it thinks they are, what it's, what it's inferring. So we run that. There we go. Can we see that on the screen, or do you want me to embiggen? Yeah, zoom in a little bit. OK. There we go. Now it's gone. It thinks those are numbers, floats, bits, big ints, um, date times. It's worked it out and done that for us. Saved us so much effort and time, it's so clever, right? Come on, that's clever, isn't it? So that's it, CSV parser 2.0. Yes, don't you, well, don't use 1.0? 1.0. Or previous version. Yeah. There's only two versions, aren't there? Yeah, only two versions. So just be really aware, um, use 2.0. And all you need to do is take your query, whatever it is, and paste it inside. I say it's all you need to do. When you paste it inside here, you have to remember to do all the double quoting. So just be aware of that. It's doing that for mm -hmm. So I did all that previously. Now, that's really great. That gives us this tabular format of our, we know what the data types are. But it's, it's good, but it's not good enough, is it? No, it's not good enough. Good. I mean, is it, it's after lunch. Everyone's a bit tired. Yeah. Is, yeah. OK. Well, everyone's listening. Uh, this is on, isn't it? <laughs> good. OK. All right. It's not good enough, is it? OK. Yeah. Well there done. There we go. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> OK. So if I create a view, just simply just put create view on top, and I'm just doing, in fact, the same, I'm just every single file in there. If I look at the metadata, so we just create the view. We haven't specified anything. We create the view with CSV parser 2.0. That's it. I can look at the metadata, and, the, and it's in here. But because it's in a DMV, um, every time you use that view, it's now using the right data types for us automagically, which is my favorite word of the last 
17 years. Um, that's amazing, isn't that's it? Amazing. That's amazing, isn't yeah. it? Just out of the box. They've all fallen asleep in the last three <laughs> seconds. I haven't done anything, and it's worked out through that CSV what it is. That's even better than Excel. All right. Go on. Okay. That, that's it. Isn't it? That's it. Okay. Let's I mean, switch back over to the slides. So, um, just to show you also the volume of data that you're reading. So, let me head over to the workspace here for a second, and uh, ignore this. Go to the monitor tab. And oh, this did you want me to show that? No, no, no. Right. So basically, what you see here is the amount of data that we're reading here for those CSV files is 1.144 gigabytes. So looking at you pay per terabyte, this is still quite an expensive query. So if you have to run this report, like let's say 100 times a day, that's uh, still it's still very cost effective, yeah? cost, effi cost efficient, yeah. cost efficient. But it's still a lot of data that we're reading, and we know that if we reduce that, we're going to be faster. Now. If we look at timings, so basically uh, we come from two minutes. Okay, so what can we do to optimize? Anybody have an idea? What would be the first step? What would you think about? What should you do? Yes. Delete all the data. Perfect. It will be really fast. Yes. Uh, out. Out. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, if you do that again, we'll get security. <laughs> parquet files. Who knows what a parquet file is? Do you oh, know? Look, they're a, look, they respond to you. Yeah. They like you. Yeah, they don't like you. No. <laughs> anyway, so you can see we're fighting our dragon, and we're starting optimizing. So what we're going to do is we're going to turn those CSVs into parquet files. Now, how do you turn CSVs into parquet files? There are multiple, way, multiple ways of doing this. Like, if we look, just look up serverless, you can do a CE test. So create external table as a slick from those open ROSAC queries you saw before, and basically push it into a new folder, and it creates your result set in parquet, uh, if you specify it's parquet. Uh, you can do it in Spark. You can do it with mapping data flows, or you can even do it with a copy data task. I would not suggest doing it with a copy data task, because it, it doesn't do everything correctly, because it doesn't create any statistics on the parquet files and all those things. Now, what is a parquet file? A parquet file basically is columnar storage. If you know column store, you basically have your segments. You don't store row by row. You store by column. And you basically have something on, on the top level, which is dictionary, where you store your unique values. And then uh, it basically compresses your data really well. So, Basically, what we say is we just take that data that we have in CSVs and compress it completely, which will increase our speed. Why? Because we read less data. Reading less data is less cost, means faster queries. Um, a parquet file also contains metadata about files. So it knows what type of data is in those files. So it can also only read parts of your files. If you specify certain um, columns that you're reading, it's going to skip those columns. If you specify certain filter clauses, it can also filter on the row groups that are in there. It's built out of row groups and column chunks. And basically, servers can eliminate those. Now, if you look at a parquet file, a parquet file has, is built, yes? It creates a parquet file, but um, do you want to repeat the question back? Uh, yeah, so, um, if a, a copy data task in parquet doesn't do exactly the same, so if you do a Spark or mapping data flows or anything or CE task, it does create uh, an extra layer, which is the statistics on those parquet files. They don't get created with a copy data task. That's the difference. Now, uh, a parquet file is built out of three parts: a header part, the data body, and the footer. The header basically is just par one. This, the, this, the file starts par one, and then we know that it's uh, a parquet file. All the way at the end, there's par one again, and then there's an offset, which basically tells you this is the amount of data, uh, this is the amount of metadata I have. And then what we do basically with service, we read that metadata, so we we do a, a seek to the end of the file. We get that final part, and we basically look at what does the data look like, and what do we need to read from this file. Now, that file is then split up into different things. So you've got multiple data blocks. Those data blocks are uh, with multiple row groups, and they have column chunks. So a column chunk basically means for one column. Let's say the first column are uh, car types. Um, you can have column or chunk one. If you just select the car types, you're only going to read this part of the data. If you have a where class, for example, uh, and you know in this one we've got the BMWs, in this one we've got Ferrari, and we say, OK, uh, I only want BMWs, we're only going to read this specific chunk. Okay, so that's basically how serverless will interact with your parquet files. So let's show you that. 
Um, basically, I'm going to start the report in the background, because it still takes some time to execute. Um, so let me clear, refresh visuals. So it's starting. Um, now, if we go and look at the data that we created, I, let's your demo, right? Or is uh, it my demo? Uh, you got all string data yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so let's switch over to yours. So Stan's created a set of files. He's taken those CSV files, and he's converted them to Parquet for me. So Parquet is the best format in the world, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> See, is, they I'm don't look, respond I to know. you. <laughs> what is it? You have to raise your hand and just say. Everybody <laughs> raise your hand if it's the best format in the world. <laughs> Yay. OK, all right. So we're going to show you. No, there's a, all right, let's. Back to, uh, we're on my screen. Perfect. OK. So we've seen this query before. I'm just selecting from a single Parquet file. We don't need to co cover that. Yeah. And we've seen describe first results there. And I'm going to run this. Parquet has metadata, has data types, has chunky bits in it. Yeah. It's compressed, so it's smaller. So. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait. What's that? But you lied to me. Why is that happening? Anyone has an idea? Yeah, it's not replying to you now, because it's a hard question. <laughs> Remember, we're coming from CSV files. And we haven't specified anything speci specific. So those CSV files that we're coming from, as such, didn't have any data types. So those data types. Well, data is the most important thing in the world. But apart yeah. from that, the most important thing in the world. So when you did the conversion, you did that in Spark. In Spark, yeah, and okay. I just didn't specify any data types. So you have to make sure that you build that metadata in and set those correct data types right. in your loading process. Now, what I can do is I, if I do the same thing again, that's exactly the same. And I can look at the data types. But I can also be very explicit and put them in. So using the open row set, I'm just going to get the top of it so it looks slightly better. Going to get rid of this. So if, and this will work for CSV, if you're not using Parser 2.0, you can specify the data types. Now, this is obviously a real pain. And you know, don't do this. Don't, don't do it. This. this is bad. Bad, so bad naughty, Stan. Indeed. Okay. You basically want to fix this on the beforehand. Because if it's going to pick up like everything is Vertia 8000, what could possibly go wrong in the system if I've got how many, what, 20 rows, 20 times 8000? Mm -hmm. um, it's going to need a lot of RAM. Yeah. It's going to need a lot of CPU. It's just going to be poor. It's going to be poor performance. And, and poor Benny is going to cry because it's going to have to read. Even though it's compressed, um, the compression is going to be poor. Yep. Because it just can't, it just doesn't know. It hasn't got yeah. the best information. You are you are letting the parquet format down, and everyone else you work with if you do that. So just you know, make sure you have those data types in, when you're loading that data. If you're using CETAS or if you're using um, Spark or mapping data flows, make sure you set those data types right. Okay. Cool. Good. Let's yeah. switch over to the results because those are, those are done. So. Um, Previously, we were at one minute, tw uh, two minutes and 10 seconds. Uh, just by turning them into parquet files, because it reads less data, we go to about 64 seconds. So Benny, are you happy? No. OK. So we need to optimize further. Uh, and if we just go and look at the amount of data that we're reading, you can see that previously we had 140 gigabytes, right? Now we're reading 8 gigabytes. A lot better, OK? But we're not there yet. It's cheaper, though. It's cheaper. It's a lot cheaper already, just and by using Parquet. So by default, if you're reporting on something with serverless, Parquet, first step. It, if you're going to do lots of reporting off it, take that CSV, convert it into Parquet, and then you're always reading off a smaller data set. OK. So can we do more? What will be the next step? Yes. Partitioning. <sighs> No, but we're all in string. What do we need to do first? We need to put our data types right. Right. So that's the first one. But that's coming as well. <laughs> if ah no no no, we're actually going to go. The, uh, 
The data types are still bad. I'm still using his poor data set. So we'll have to convert the data types every time we query it. So we want the data set on disk to have the best data types. Indeed. But you know, if we had a prize for the next question we're going to ask, you'd win it. Yeah. If we had a prize. If we, if we had a prize. Yeah. You win our respect, love, and admiration, though. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, me, That's isn't yours. it? yours. Sorry. Yes. Data, so they're the most important thing in the world. All right, everybody in here, sorry about this, because I can't really see you because of these horrible lights. Everyone uses SQL Server, right? Everyone uses a database. Is everybody asleep? <laughs> Please don't make me pick on you. <laughs> Because I get told off by HR, they don't like it, the complaints. So does everybody use a database? That's like three people I heard. Does everybody use a database? OK, do you specify your data types? OK, so I don't need to cover any of this, do I? OK, so good data typing is so important. And one of the things that, you'll, that we're going through, we're going through all the things that you can tweak and change to make the queries better. Because it's serverless, there's a lot that you could do with your databases that you can't do. So these are the things that you can actively do to make it faster. And why are these data types still important for serverless? What's behind it? So, is it a database? Yeah. Yay. So it's still a database. So underneath, so just like in Terry Pratchett's disk world, it is turtles all the way down, right? It is just, it's always going to SQL Server, whether it's serverless. You know, just think about, you wouldn't do that in your database, would you? If you had Verchar 8000s all over the place, you would get very unhappy people. The people who look at it, not the people who don't look at it, because only the technical people in here are doing it. Never mind. OK, so Verchars. Use chars if it's fixed. If you know exactly what it's going to be, you'll get the best compression. You know, use UDF if you're using UDF 16. You know, uh, NVAR chars. Uh, if you are joining, sorting, group buys, you know, it's much faster on an integer. So you may do a tiny little bit of ETL, maybe to convert those values so you can do better joins. Um, uh, what else have I put? Uh, Scheme inference. Yeah, so the schema inference is, so what I've shown you in the, in the parser 2.0 is this is what the engine is guessing. But it's only looking at a subset of rows. If later on, like a billion rows or a billion files later, suddenly in that integer, for example, I had one very recently where there we had an EAN. Anyone know EAN is just a big number. So everything loaded except one file where someone had put unknown in it. Just so it's only going to go through the first set of files, first, just like Excel, when you get Excel to work out what the data types are, it only looks through a small subset. So you need to just check it. Don't assume it's going to be right. And well, what best practices. Oh, I put the link. So when you get the slide deck, I put a link in for the best practices. Please read it. Um, it's not a long one. And also, there is another page. So if you get an error on serverless, you will get a link to a URL. And if you look at the error, then go to the URL. It will tell you pretty much what's wrong 99% of the time. So the error message will be slightly cryptic, but just go to the link, and then you'll work it out. Yeah, that's it. I've ranted for long enough. Demo. Is it my turn again? Yeah, I think so. My laptop's <laughs> gone off. OK. <laughs> Log pad, on again. Pad, quickly. Let me log in. There you go. There we go. So this one has got exactly the same thing. I can run it. Um, this is one where you have. This is with the data type. So I had my ETL guys do this. And uh, we basically now have the right data types when we loaded that data. So those forget right. files now basically have, this, have the right metadata. There we go. And I'll show you the metadata in a bit so you can see how you can analyze. If you have those parquet files, how can you analyze on the beforehand if they're correct or not? And I'll show you that in a bit. Look, and then you'll see what I didn't do was absolutely double check um, how, they, how these mapped across to the inference mm -hmm. from, because um, these are actually slightly different. Then yeah. the, when we use the parser 2.0, and then you compare it with these data types, 
they are very slightly different. Because these are coming from Parquet, and the other ones are coming from sequence. And in Parquet, it's what we define for it. Well, the other one makes a guess on what we're doing. Cool. And then so really, the okay. others are all the same, yeah. Then we go and look at one specific file. So um, does any of you know a bit of Spark? Yeah. OK, we've got a few people that know a bit of Spark. So I'm just going to show you a notebook. They're not very dangerous. You can you just use them. <laughs> not um, very, not <laughs> very dangerous. <laughs> so if we go over here to the Develop tab, there's Anatomy of a Parquet file, it's called. So basically what I do is I've got a data frame here where I just load like one Parquet file. Uh, and I just display it. It's basically just very easy. You can just right click a file and then just say load to notebook and it just creates that code for you. Once you've done that, you can use something called Pi Arrow uh, to basically stream a file into uh, a Pi Arrow data frame. And a Pi Arrow data frame just use one file to check what my file is looking like. And that Pi Arrow basically has um, functionality is called metadata. So what it shows me, so I've got one parquet file in there. It tells me that I have 20 columns. I've got about 8.6 million rows in there. I've got two row groups. Remember, column chunks, row groups. So we've got 20 column chunks, two row groups. Okay, And it's about the size that we have for that full. Now, um, we can go and look a bit further. I can go and look at what's inside that metadata and what's in row group zero. It tells me in row group zero, I've got 20 columns, about 5.2 million rows, and this is about the size in bytes that I have. Um, I can also go and look at the schema. So I can just say, hey, give me the schema. And you can see here that it basically has the data types in that metadata. And that's the data types that we're getting in his query. Okay, So it knows what data types are, have been defined, and it uses those, uh, those data types to actually um, uh, translate to our serverless SQL pool. And then you can also look at a specific column. So I can just go, hey, in this row group, what's happening in column six? I can just go and look, OK, column six. It's uh, an integer. It has 5.2 million rows. Uh, it's the PU location ID. Um, there are statistics on this, which has a minimum value and a maximum value. Uh, it tells me the number of values. And it isn't really distinct, because we only have two uh, values in here. Uh, and it tells the compression and the encoding and all that stuff. If we look at a different column, um, for example, column, uh, you can also specify statistics. Sorry, You can just say, hey, give me the statistics of that specific column. And you can also go and look at column one, for example, and you show, it shows you that we have a lot more distinct values here. So we've got min and max, and it's somewhere in between all the values. But those things are being used by serverless to optimize your query. So if you put those things in there, if you do your load with your, with your Spark correctly, I'll talk a bit more about how to prep your data with Spark later. But this is very important stuff when you're going to optimize your serverless queries. Now, let's head back over here. How fast will that report? How fast was that report? With normal data types. I think we can just run it. So here we have the right data types. Let's see how long it runs. Should be around, any guesses? Less than five seconds? No? OK. That's <laughs> five, uh, about. Please work. Please work. Uh, come on, hope. demo gods. Demo gods, come on. Uh, I still have. Good internet. Uh, 20 seconds. 22 seconds. It's around 20 to 30 seconds. So if we look at the previous one that we had, we went from 2 minutes and 10 to 1 minute. Specifying our right data types, we go to 20 to 30 seconds. Ooh, come on. If we were in America, okay. people would clap. Benny, are you happy? Nope. Yeah. OK. Oh, goodness gracious. No. He's, he's never happy. He's never happy. So yeah, uh, previously it ran in 15 seconds, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> data types do matter, but can we do more? So what should we do next? Partitioning, yes, good. <laughs> great, yeah, yeah. great. So partitioning. So partitioning basically means that we're going to partition our files, our forget files, and we're basically going to define multiple folder structures underneath um, where we're going to say, OK, we're just going to select data from this year. Uh, so we can have uh, partition by date or partition by a certain column value. And then you basically say, um, I'm not going to read a part of it. So you can use Spark to write partition by. So you can say, um, use this data frame, write it, partition by this column, and it will then partition by that column. And the best I.O. is which I.O.? 
No I.O. No, no I.O., indeed. So if you can skip data, basically what it does, serverless will start, it will look at the query, and it will look what data can I skip. And if it doesn't need to touch the files, if it doesn't need to touch it, we're not going to have any charging for it, and it will be quite fast. So one of the first steps it does, it basically lists the files it needs to go and read from. And with partitioning, we can skip loads of data. Okay? And Open Rowset FilePath allows you to do that. So Open Rowset FilePath is basically your best friend to do that. So let me show you how that works. So um, if you want to partition your data set, the thing you need to do is um, load it into a data frame. So um, what I did, I took uh, his uh, data that we had before, taxi MP it's called, taxi non-partitioned. And what I did with it is um, I just wrote it to partition data. So I say, uh, so this is partitioned by year, sorry. Uh, this is an old statement. <laughs> should have fixed that. Uh, but basically, write it, partition by, and it's going to partition it by that specific folder. And it looks like a little bit like this. Let me see. Do I have anything here open? So um, it makes the year 2010, but I have got 2010 because I renamed the folders. Anyway, it just makes a folder for each uh, year, and then it has the parquet files that are linked with that year in there. OK? Now, let's see what impact I've made um, if we go and look at the, um, at the report. So the reports here, I'm going to go to partition by year, and I'm going to refresh the visuals. There we go. So four to five, seven seconds. Way better, isn't it? So we come from two minutes and 10 seconds. Now we're at seven seconds for the slowest. It's a big improvement, right? Yes. I don't. I don't think they. I don't think they're. Bad. They don't look happy. <laughs> I mean, they really don't. I mean, look at them. Yeah. God, they're just. It's a really hard audience today. Don't tell them that. So how do you do that? So basically, if you want to read from one file, you just do a count of that one file, and you can see here that you've got your file part in there. Okay. So this one file contains about 5.4 million rows. Then you can just say with wildcards. Uh, Star, 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 which basically means taxi, star, parquet. So star means that specific folder, and star parquet means I get all the files. You can just put a backslash there as well. It doesn't need to put star parquet there. Okay. Um, if I do a count of that, just to show you the sheer size of data that we're working on, what was, it, was, what was the, the name of the session? 1.4 billion. Here you go. We're working on. There was also another trick, which was slash star star. Yeah, you show slash that? star star. No, I'm oh. not showing it. I'll show that maybe later. Okay. 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 So 1.4 billion rows we're working on. Who has a system that can report on seven seconds based on files on 1.4 billion rows? Who does that? How mm. What's the fastest query that you have okay. if you would have to work with that type, that type of system? It's 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 50 seconds. With serverless, you can really get that thing to work really, really fast. And you do that using the FilePath function. So in the FilePath function, you can just say, hey, give me the data from 2012 in the where class. But this basically gives me an issue. I cannot specify r.filepath everywhere. But what I can do is I can use that r.filepath and create a view out of it. And just say, add that FilePath as a column. And if I then put it in the where class, or if I just in Power BI click, I want this here, it will skip all the other folders and just read that one folder. So I created that view. I created also another view here, which is called taxi without year, just to show you the difference. And I've got like a simple query going between the two of them. So one where the year is in 2012, 2013, and the other one, we don't have the year column. Uh, we basically, it's on the same uh, value, but we're doing a comparison of if we do non-partitioned and partitioned, what's the amount of data that we would be reading? So, so hands up who uses serverless, but hasn't used file path. It's, not, it's not a name and shame. It's just like, we're just not making this well known enough. Yeah. That's all. Now let's see what the difference is in data that we're reading between those two queries. So this one reads 500 megabytes, the fast one. This one reads 17 gigabytes. So by partitioning that, you're really making it as small as possible, and you're, you're able to do a lot more queries for the same amount of money. Any questions so far? No? No, they've gone to. Oh, well, one. Oh, one. He's awake. 
best size of a partition. It's basically a folder, and in the folder, your files should be around 500 megabytes each. That's about 500 to 1 gigabyte. You, if they're bigger, it's a bit less performant. I'll show you that like right now. <laughs> so basically, uh, we can run that. If I, if I run it a few times, it runs in about five seconds. Okay? So seven seconds, the latest run, but five seconds usually if, you, if it's all warmed up. Because basically, also what it does in the background, it creates statistics on those files inside serverless. And once it created those statistics, it basically knows better on what the data looks like, and it will increase the speed of it. So it reduced the data, and we're, it costs less, and it's faster. Can we do more? Yes, we can do one more thing, but this doesn't. Yes. So basically, you create sort of a, a, a view or an open row set, indeed, and it goes and knows statistics about the files that you're specifying. So those files will get a statistic created on it. You'll see, like, if you're running queries, uh, the first time you'll see global stats creation, and it creates stats on that data. So you sometimes notice a performance impact the first time you do yeah. that query over that file. So that might be that the first time it runs in 20 seconds, and all the letter results will be seven seconds, five seconds, because the first time it creates statistics on those. Yes? Is the uh, oh. statistics uh, persisted if you sort of pause the serverless? They are persisted, yeah. yes. They're in the uh, yeah. So are they persisted? If you pause the, the serverless, it's an on-demand query. You can't pause it, but yeah. the <laughs> but concept the concept of pausing. Yeah. There's no servers. It's serverless. Yeah. So they're yeah. stored on storage. Yeah. It's a simple answer, but but just yeah. there's there's no pausing. It's not dedicated pool. You run it. It provisions it for you. You don't use it for a few minutes. Yeah. And then it will just disappear into the ether. You're not paying for the existence of the CPU. You're only ever paying for the query, the actual data that is transferred. So the, do you want to, we're running out of time. OK. I'll, I'll talk forever on that. Um. One more thing that we can do is using data elimination. So Spark SQL, you can write your data in a specific order. And if you write in your specific order, you can have your row groups, row group one containing data uh, for um, this specific PO location ID, and the second row group for another PO location ID. And you can also skip those parts. Same with columns chunks. If you only select the columns that you need, you basically reduce the amount of data that's being read. And again, open row set file path is your best friend because we've got the partitioning on there as well. Now, very quickly showing you that before we go to the final part. Um, if we go and look at the sorted part yeah, here, um, again, pi arrow shown you before. Um, we can go and look at a specific column here. So row group zero, column six, this is a specific file I'm looking at. You can see that this one has uh, the PO location ID uh, two and three. While if we look at the second row group, so row group one over here, this one only contains value three. So if we basically if we query where PO location ID equals two, we read less data. So how does that look? If we go and query that um, segment elimination over here, so here you see two and three. Okay, so we've got our three and we've got our two. And you run that, what you'll see in the messages that I have a total amount with a capital A, which is not with a capital A here. There we go. Let me do that again. Bear with me for a second. There we go. Run this again. Ba -ba 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 -ba. So is this stuff new to people? Everybody knows this stuff already. Then why are we up here? So is this new? Is this interesting? Yeah. I mean, there are two different questions, yeah. so answer them differently. Just to show you, 140, same file, 47. So you skip parts of your file as well, which I think is quite impressive. If you just have those files done correctly, and how do you do that correctly? So just to give you, uh, I'll give you the, the, I'll put a post on Twitter where all the material that we have is in. And there's one notebook which is called Sorted Parquet. Uh, no, not uh, preparing your data, um, where you have a partition sorted data set. So where you're going to say, repartition by year, sort in those partitions, PU location ID, 
partition by the year, and then you basically write a partition per year, and you write a file in there that is sorted by PU location ID. So you can get that row group elimination when querying that. Now, the thing is, my data set is a bit too voluminous to do this, so I have to create multiple files. But uh, I didn't correctly make that at this point in time, but I can show you that it reads less data. So I've done this, and that translates to a certain query. Um, so if I go to Power BI over here, and if I run the sorted partitioned one. Is it going to be fast enough for Benny? That's the question. It's the question if Benny is going to be happy. I don't think so. So this runs 9 to 10 seconds. So it's a bit slower. And I'll tell you why. Because that data set, has, is, uh, the parquet file is too big. It's 10 gigabytes. It cannot really scale the serverless properly because it thinks he needs to mo do, do more memory. If those files would be between 500 megabytes and 1 gigabyte, it would be a lot faster. But it will read that file. And it will read less data. So if you go and look at the data that's being read here, and refresh that. It reads about 270 megabytes, while previously over here it was 300 megabytes. So you do reduce the amount of data that you're reading with it. But it's a bit slower. So cost efficient, but slower. But it's basically because we're creating one file. Let me just quickly show you how it looks. It's precon. Here we go. So you see that's one file. Uh, no, this one does not have data. Let's say 2017. You can see here that the file is 2.4 gigabytes, which is not ideal. We want to have that smaller. OK. So is that really fast enough for Benny? Is it fast enough for you, Benny? Nope. <sighs> I mean anyway, we are happy because we did all we could. We reduced that from 2 minutes and 10 seconds to about 5 seconds, the fastest with partitioning. Let's say 7 seconds. Previously, it was five seconds. We are happy. So yeah, and yeah. I think they—I mean—they all look absolutely miserable. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but is Benny happy? I mean, that's really the key. Our dragon returns. So, what? What happened to my report? Is it ready? Your report now runs in five seconds, sir. No. 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 OK. So I want my report in less than a second. I've seen this little video by the, uh, the guys in the cube called um, Adam and, and what's his name again? Um, Is it Patrick? Yeah, it's Patrick. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the one. That's the one. Yeah. And they use this thing called hybrid tables. And I think that's going to fix all my problems. So yeah. essentially, what this thing called hybrid tables is going to do it's going to fix everything you two Muppets can't do, and it's doing that, it's doing that in Power BI. Because I now, I don't believe it. what you're doing is you're reading one gigantic table, and you're just reading it like it is a big CSV file. It's not optimized for Power BI. It's not a, that thingy, the, the, the hexagon schema they're calling it. Is it hexagon schema? Um, rectangle schema? Star, sch star schema. It's oh, not a. Okay, it's okay. not a. It's not a star schema. And and they always keep telling me it's all about a star schema. So, hybrid tables with a star schema is going to fix everything I need. So yeah, the thing is, I went ahead because I mean I saw the video and I just fixed it myself. And what I did is I did it. I mean this is a report and. Do you want me to hold it for you? Yeah, that's that's yeah. useful. Thank you. And there we go. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is a report and it's actually just going beyond less than a few seconds. The thing is, what I'm doing is I changed most of the logic, well, most of the logic, by a few clicks inside of Power BI. So for the interest of time, I'm just going to show you what was happening behind the report. And I'm inside of Power Query, which is this thing, the magic, uh, the magic thing that fixes all our problems. And what I did is the only thing I had to do was create a couple of parameters. And those are two parameters that are a date and times. So it's a start date and it's an end date. Those are going to be used to automatically generate the partitions on the Power BI side. So as soon as I've done this logic, I've created a filter. So that filter is going to be set on the date that I want to create my, my partitions on. And that's going to create those ranges from start to end based on years is what I've put it now. Then all it takes is to go into Power BI and then 
I probably need to zoom. This is lovely when you're not using your own laptop. <laughs> <laughs> you need to zoom after, and then you right click on your table and you say, I want to do incremental refresh. The incremental refresh is going to bring up a user interface for you. And there you're going to say, OK, I want to optimize a table. I want to have the data for the last 10 years. And then make sure that you're doing it for uh, ranges for partitions of one year. And then the beauty of this thing called hybrid tables is it gets the latest data in real time in the direct query mode. Because now, when these two Muppets create, give me the report, I'm going to fire off queries at Synapse for every single thing I'm doing inside of my report. And for historical data, that's not going to change. That's not the best strategy. We can store some of the data inside of Power BI and do that more optimistically and more optimal. So by firing this off in the direct query mode, it's going to create automatically partitions for me on Power BI. I get to import my historical data. That's not going to change anymore. And then for the new data or the, change, the data that's changing on, on a daily basis, I still do that direct query. And that's where the partition elimination, the segment elimination on the Synapse side is going to pay off for a very big thing as well. So essentially, with a few clicks of the button, I did more work than these two did. And that's everything you need to take away from the session, essentially. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So if, the, if you, the, the question, question was is, about yeah. yeah sorry. If, if you if you use CSV files for this, and that was a question. Will you be charged for more data? Um, the initial load, yes, because it will read more data with the serverless. If you put that, all those optimization steps that we did, you reduce the amount of data that you're pushing in there. Uh, and also for the real-time queries, you're going to also be charged more because your CSV file will read more. You would preferably have that in Parquet or something. Yes? Combine the two approaches, is that the optimal? That should be the optimal. There is also something else, but ask Penny that. You can turn that around. Instead of having the archival data, you can, uh, in, uh, instead of having the archival data into your Power BI, you can have the old data in, uh, in direct query. You, you can do that, but that's not with a few clicks of a button in a UI. Then you need to do some actual more in-depth stuff. Um, but if you want to look at that, there are videos on the Guy in a Cube channel how, where they explain it, how to do it. There was one more question. Is, okay. is, was that the serverless support delta table? Yeah. Yeah, you can just right click, right click the delta table, just say uh, script this as delta, and you can get an open row set where type is delta. Uh, oh, the question, oh, the question from the chat. Yeah. A parquet with delta, basically parquet with delta works. Uh, it is a little bit slower because of the JSON that's in there, but um, it is it does work. Okay. And another one. Are there any limitations to consider when using parquet? Any limitations? Yeah, you cannot write to a parquet file. Yeah. So delta compressed. fixes that with because it basically builds a transaction log on there. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's head back over to our slides for one quick second here. Uh, there was a lot of Benny Hearts, because he's happy now. So quick recap. Always try to use, when you're doing the reporting, always try to use Parquet instead of CSV if you can. Check the data types. Partition and sort your data in the files. Only select the data and the columns you need, because if you don't select the column, you're not reading it from the file. And serverless is amazing and very cost efficient. Thank you very much. My name is Stan Valens. This is Mark and Benny. Thank you very much. And give yourself a clap for the great participation. Yes. <laughs> yeah, go on. And feedback. Right, feedback. Oh, feedback. Right, before you get up, I see you getting up to leave. Just do that now. There's like several minutes. There probably isn't yeah. any coffee or biscuits there yet. So if you don't do it now, you'll forget. You know, life gets in the way. So just do. Look, people have left. Um, oh, come back. So we'll be around the whole week. 
uh, yeah. until Saturday evening. So if you have any questions or you want to know a bit more about serverless, things that we didn't wow. handle now, you come over to us. We can basically help you and you get it. You were so scary. I, mean, I was not expecting that. Do you like it? Okay, nice.